All right, so let's talk a little bit about sensitization. So when we talk about, about sensitization, generally we're talking about um, processes that are excitatory. In other words, um, uh, you are increasing the likelihood of something happening. So um, with sensitization, if you're not familiar with what that is, essentially it is whenever we have a behavior that becomes um, heightened uh, due to repetition. So uh, um, I, try, I wanna give you an example without spoiling some of the others that I have coming up. But um, for me, okay, so maybe, here's, here's a good one. Um, if I was in the classroom with you right now, and, I, and you've probably had professors do this before, they slam their hands on the desk, right? And they make a really loud sound for you that startles you, right? And you can feel yourself being on edge, right? You can feel your, your, your senses being heightened. You feel a little bit more at disease or at unease. You're, you're, you know, you're not feeling well. And so if somebody else were to shout directly after that, you would jump maybe even higher, right? Because you're on edge. You're already scared. That is an example of sensitization. Uh, and so whenever something happens, we can be very sensitive to it. Maybe that's one way to think about it. So the strength or the frequency of that behavior is going to increase with repetition. The reason why this is important, the reason why this is an example, perhaps you can think of it as memory, is because that experience changes your future experiences. So for example, if thunder hits right now and it hits pretty close away, it freaks, or at least it freaks me out and I get on edge, right? Um, and so I'm very sensitive to what's going on. In other words, I'm directly influenced by something that just happened. That memory of that really loud bang is going to influence my behavior for the next couple of minutes. So think back to implicit memory and priming. Uh, you may remember priming when we were talking about looking at different uh, stimulus, stimulus sets and how looking at those things can influence what you're likely to respond on coming up, that's all this is, right? Basically, we're talking about a different version of that, about how this prior experience is going to influence what we are doing right now, and that's memory. It's not explicit memory, but it is implicit memory. Another example here would be smelling something whenever you're really hungry. So sometimes you get really hungry, and you smell that bacon or those brownies or whatever, and you're thinking about it, and then you can just feel yourself get even more hungry. That is an example of sensitization. So uh, an example that I have here that I really like uh, is a uh, small dog. You've probably seen this video before, but it seems like every time somebody says his name, he gets more upset. That is an example of sensitization. But, in a, in a, in a, and so definitely check out that link if you want. Um, but to frame this in a little bit more of an academic uh, setting, thinking back to the aplesia, the sea slug. Whenever you touch a gill near the sea slug, there are there are three different things that could happen. Um, well, whenever whenever you touch it, uh, essentially the sea slug will withdraw its gill. So this is a very this is a very sensitive part of of the of the sea slug. So whenever you poke it, it's going to withdraw that that thing away from you. So there are three things that could happen. One is that it withdraws, and then, or actually, sorry, you poke it the first time, and then it, you know, it, it withdraws like it naturally does because it is, re it is reflex, it is involuntary. But then what happens? There are three different things that could happen. One is you could poke it, and it very quickly withdraws and then doesn't. So it withdraws and then very quickly releases. So it, um, oh, I don't want to spoil the stuff that's coming up, but this is a form of habituation where you touch it and then it realizes that it's not in danger and because of that it releases quicker than it did the first time. That is one outcome. Another outcome though is that if you poke it and then it withdraws for a really long time, longer than the second, uh, sorry, longer than the first time you poked it, that is an example of sensitization third outcome would be that you have the exact same response as you did the first time and each of these three outcomes mean something for one if that second poke has a slower withdrawal that means that this animal seems to have learned something that it is not in danger and that it is 
probably that its memory of that poke did not end aversively, and so it is not going to, uh, to, to react strongly to it. But if it does withdraw for longer the second time than the first time, then what that animal has learned is that this is something that it should be worried about. This is something that it should be protective of, and so it behaves differently. The third outcome, if it doesn't change at all, then that can tell us that it hasn't learned anything, right? That you poke it, and let's say it withdraws for five seconds and then releases, then you poke it again and it withdraws for five seconds and then releases. What that means is that this animal hasn't learned anything, its behavior has not changed. So those are the three outcomes. Now, whenever people do test this, typically, in most cases, it is going to be a habituation. It is going to withdraw and then relax faster than it than the first time because it has learned that it is not in danger, that it is not being harmed. So um, using this kind of technique where you're just poking, you know, um, uh, the skill of this animal tells us a lot about what kind of uh, what kind of behaviors are happening, but also because of a simplified nervous system, you can actually see those neurons working in action. So here is another example that is using an animal that may be a little bit easier to visualize. We have a mouse here, and uh, the first day this mouse is hanging out, where you know, nothing's happening. The second day, nothing's happening. But the third day, we give a really, really big alarm, and that animal is going to freak out. It's going to uh, you know, wonder what the heck was going on. And then the fourth day, it may also be on edge because of that really loud sound. So in both, in all these cases, and I guess maybe I used sound a little bit too much to give, if you want a different example, uh, this one that I remember from my childhood, uh, my brother, if I would go up to him and if I, if I punched him in the arm once, he would say, ow, right? And he would, you know, probably try to tell mom that I had punched him. Um, but if I got close to him again, he would flinch, and he would, he would preemptively say, ow, right? That's because he was sensitized to that. His behavior had been influenced by a prior, a prior event. So habituation, which is the second piece of what I was talking about, this is whenever we have a behavior that reduces itself as a product of repetition. So it has reduced the strength or the frequency of that behavior uh, because essentially we have learned that nothing bad or nothing good is going to follow whatever that, that stimulus was, whatever that event was. So um, you can think of it as like getting used to something. Whenever I was in grad school, I lived right next to a railroad. Um, and when I first moved into that house, uh, I recognized it all the time. I would always tell whenever the 7 p.m. railroad was driving by, or train was driving by, it was very, very loud. Um, but after living there for like a month, I almost never noticed it. Uh, and um, to the point where whenever people would come over and they would hang out, and that 7 p.m. train drove by, people would be like, how do you live with this? And I would be like, live with what? Oh, you mean the train. I just tuned it out. That's an example of habituation. I had heard that stimulus so many times, but nothing directly happened to me. It didn't put me in danger. It didn't affect what I did. And so because of that, I habituated to that response. We can also habituate to things like the smell of our own house. This, you know, you, you know what it's like when you come back from vacation and you smell your house and you're like, oh yeah, that's the smell. You get the idea. So another example would be like if you tell the same joke over and over, you'll realize that it gets fewer numbers of laughs as that joke is repeated. That is an example of habituation. So this is studied a lot with non-humans using the acoustic startle response. You could do this in the classroom as well, um, where you make a really loud sound and you just look to see what that animal does. Uh, so if I was in the classroom and I slammed my hands on the table, it would startle people. But if I did that 10 more times as the day went on, you're, you would startle less and less and less each time. Because essentially what you have learned is that that particular sound is not going to cause you any pain or any harm or any discomfort. It's just there. So for the acoustic word startle response, you hear that sound. You may have heard it on your speakers there. And the animal is going to flip out. The second time you do it, it's going to flip out, but not as much. But after 100 times of doing this, 
this animal does not care about that sound whatsoever. And so thinking about what, and so this is all stuff that behaviorists would, you know, would study, but they didn't talk about this as memory, right? Because here I have, you know, this, this little uh, bubble where the rat is thinking something. Behaviorists would say, yeah, the rat isn't thinking anything. This is all stuff that is happening as a function of the stimulus and the response, as the reflex and the and sorry, the reflex and the physical event that caused that reflex. You don't need to infer anything more. What Tolman, and and actually before I get into Tolman, but that's also when we talk about that article. We're going to talk about an article next week about sea slugs. You're going to find that essentially that the you don't need thoughts to 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 have habituation and sensitization. It is not necessarily a mental event. You don't need to think about it. Um, which is, for memory, you know, what does that sound like? It sounds like implicit memory, right? That you don't need to voluntarily or consciously be able to recall what it is for it to work. Um, so, behaviorist approach would say that this is a decrease in behavior, but you don't need memory uh, to, to do that. Now, our, our definition, our understanding of memory is much more broad, so we include things like this as a component of memory, because now we know this is implicit memory uh, that is doing this. This, this subject, its behavior has changed um, uh, as a product of its prior experience, of something that it has learned of a memory. So uh, that acoustic startle response, the dependent measure that people measure here is going to be how high or how much or how long they jump. That is a measurement of essentially um, uh, uh, how much they've learned. Um, there is a, uh, a video here that can show you the acoustic startle response in a rat that's hanging out in a lab. And you'll see that it learns pretty quickly that the sound is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, so habituation happens in all animals. It's not just slugs. It's not just rats. It's not just humans. This happens for amoebas and paramecia. This is something that happens for all organisms that have nervous systems in any form, um, even some that don't have nervous systems. But what this tells us is that this form of learning, habituation, is kind of um, the some of the most basic behaviors outside of reflexes that we have. And they're going to underline things like classical conditioning, generalization, and other things. So comparing habituation and sensitization, habituation is when we decrease the behavior, is whenever we uh, are repeatedly exposed to stuff without being hurt. Um, and they are stimulus specific. In other words, um, if you hear that, if for me, hitting the desk over and over and over again, you might habituate to it. But the moment that somebody makes a sound that's not that, you're, you're not going to have that same kind of habituation effect to it. So it is stimulus specific in that regard. Sensitization, on the other hand, is usually with a very intense stimulus. It's going to increase our behavior, and usually you only need one trial for it to work. This is something that whenever thunder strikes, you don't need it to strike again for it to work. You're already on edge. So again, just relating this back to the, the kind of the core subject matter, drawing that connection with memory, essentially we've, we experience something, that experience is going to change our nervous system, and because of that, we're going to behave differently. So, let's say you're in a thunderstorm. You hear that thunder once, it's very, very loud, it puts you on edge, but you're safe. The second time you hear that thunder, maybe you're going to do a little bit better with it. Maybe you're not going to jump as much. The third, fourth, and fifth times you hear that thunder, you're going to jump less and less and less. So, why? Why did you jump less? Because you habituated to it. But that habituation is because you have experienced something in the past and that process has now changed the way that you respond to it. And any change in behavior is going to reflect a change in our nervous system and the way that these cells respond to one another. How do we know that? Because of our research with sea slugs. We know about that, and, and we'll talk more about that uh, in, in coming classes. I don't want to get into it too much. That's a little bit better for next week. 
So I think that's where I want to end this particular week. Um, there is some more information here, but this is all information that we're going to cover next week when we talk about the classic article about the sea slugs um, and more when we talk about neuroplasticity. So hopefully what I hope in this particular you know pair of videos that we've that we've emphasized is how these very very basic behaviors do reflect memory in some way again it's not explicit memory but it is implicit memory something a past event influences our behavior and because of that it's memory all right so that's all that I want to talk about uh, this week as preparation for uh, for these articles that we have coming up so thank you for hanging in there, and I will uh, see you online.